And we are live. Welcome to another episode of Business Focus Live with me, John, where we talk about business-related topics as well as news from here and around the world. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe and let's get started. And we're back. Thank you for joining me again today. So to start off, we have a lot of things to talk about. So let's not waste any more time. So for our first topic today, uh, the four tech giants in the world, namely Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook are in trouble. So what do I mean? So they've been faced with much scrutiny from the public as well as in the government sector in terms of their mon monopolistic nature of trying to capitalize uh, in terms of their power that they have garnered over the years. Now, are they going too much? Controlling the market and so forth? Let's take a closer look. Here. Oh, sorry. This one. There you go. So the house is investigating faults, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, as well as Google for engaging anti-competitive monopolistic tactics. Now, obviously, this is not this is not came as a surprise for many of us, but obviously, governments are cracking down in terms of what is happening here. As pressure has been mounting, you know, over the past several years of in terms of how they conduct their businesses, not just towards their consumer or their customers, but as well as other competitors. Is it considered fair? what they're doing or they're just taking advantage in terms of their market position in the market. So let's see here. So as mentioned here, uh, they've been accused of being engaged in anti-competitive monopoly style tactics and government is stepping in, doing some considerable probing if they need certain changes in regards to the federal law wherein government regula regulators can bring the Silicon Valley back in check. Now, obviously for quite some time, there has been little to lack to no monitoring in terms of who, who regulates those big companies in terms of Facebook's uh, trying to control what can be posted and not be posted. Uh, in terms of mo Amazon's monopoly, in terms of who can, who can sell their products and also take advantage compete with those same resellers that they depend upon then you also have google and apple in terms of their ecosystem of using their platform as the only means for developers if they don't follow suit you know they have they've left with no choice so you know at the end of the day you know the startup developers companies who wants to compete with them are having a difficult time so what's the recourse here so let's continue here so again, according to the investigation by the House, the antitrust panel, it's mentioned that they relied on dubious, harmful means to solidify their dominance in terms of web search, smartphones, social networking, as well as shopping. Now, obviously, all of those companies are market leaders in their respective platforms. And the process, they've evaded the federal regulators whose primary task is to ensure the companies do not grow into su such unmatched corporate titans. But obviously, that's a little bit too late for now. They've grown too big. You know, they're, it's, it's difficult for them to fail now. But the question is, can the government, can they do something about it, right? With the market dominant or with such few companies here can dictate what the outcome will be in terms of who can sell, who can buy, what can we do about it, and so forth. So, as mentioned here, congressional investigators faulted Facebook for gobbling up potential competitors with impunity. So it's not only that, you also have Google improperly scrapped rival websites and forced its technology on others to reach its pole position in terms of search and advertising. Now, obviously, Google is known for the search engine and obviously, they would prefer their own products to be at the top of the search list if there is a com other competitors that would be you know, somewhere in the middle at the bottom, which is, you know, it can be construed as unfair practices here. So it's not only that, 
Now you have also Amazon as well as Apple who exerts their own monopoly power in terms to protect their own corporate footprints. So essentially what they do is put small competing sellers in the case of Amazon and then for software developers by putting them at this disadvantage. So you know if you've been hearing the news in the past few weeks with regards to you know many many companies big companies at that who have issues with apple's 30 percent you know fee for providing their platform uh using their platform and so forth and does this bring better service value to your customers maybe maybe not because if other companies cannot come in and compete within the same marketplace then you know it becomes a monopoly yes. and it's difficult to see how can the consumers at the end of the day benefit from such monopoly or total control of apple here same goes to amazon as well if they're the only you know e-commerce platform in the market where can resellers shift to a different platform there's no other name in game whether they try to compete with them or they try to buy them out or you know find tactics that is considered unethical in a sense but because they have the power they just can do whatever they want without any repercussions continuing with others so the government is now focusing on the tech industry similar how they did you know decades or a hundred years past when the monopolies were controlled by the oil magnet at the time and the railroad system so that was several years several several decades ago so their cost the question now is to help strengthen competition and rein in on the anti-monopoly behavior across industries which would benefit consumers now obviously this doesn't just limit in the tech industry you can see it in many uh, industries like for example in in the financial institute institutions there are very few financial institutes who control the entire market and who regulates them you can also see that in the automate automakers industry automotive uh, industry there are very few players there who controls them as long as companies goes to a certain point if there's no regulators who keeps a tab on them making sure that they're not going too far in terms of you know manipulating the market to their advantage you know that's the case to be also stated here to put it simply companies were once considered scrappy which were you know a is something that is desired especially for underdog startup that challenge the status quo to become the kind of monopolies that was last so in previous era and you know as you can clearly see you know once amazon was a small company back then but years or decades later they're the big giant that they are right now and turns the tide has turned right they get to dictate the terms in terms of what the marketplace should be and how can they control it so question is what can the government do here should they allow this to proliferate and to the point of you no know, monitoring and such anyway so according to the justice department which is what they're trying to do now probing cracking down finding out if they've gone too far which as the case here then they should find or revise the law or the antitrust law regarding protecting the interests of uh, consumers and other players in the market as well so as mentioned here the justice department and the federal trade commission have the power to probe the potential wrongdoing review and approve large mergers before they occur well i guess you know they've let it proliferate for quite some time so that in the case of apple they're able to acquire other companies that supplements their foothold in the marketplace similar to how amazon is doing from e-commerce to streaming whether it twitch or in prime streaming videos and so forth right in the case of google they're now transitioning for software to hardware components and the problem here is uh have they gained a dominant foothold not just economically but politically, right anyway so the government has failed at key occasions to stop monopolies from rolling up their competitors and fail to protect the american people not just the american people but people in the world in general as you notice uh i think apple or not apple, uh, facebook has faced lawsuit in the the european market for their 
uh, data privacy issues of manipulating, controlling the data information of citizens in Europe. So what will happen here? So at the end of the day, what can they do? So in the, in the case of Google, so you can see here, they SWAT users, uh, the, I'm sorry, they, they tap the vast swaths of users' data that become an ecosystem. So taking control of your search history so they can provide advertising, mapping mobile, and even more. So obviously they try to take advantage of that. And obviously as in the case here, so it's not just Facebook, but also Google has been fined for billions for unfairly manipulating their search results. And you can clearly see here, it goes on and on here with the other companies with the same common denominator of in terms of how they manipulate the market to their advantage. Now, is it a bad thing to take advantage of your strengths? Yes, in a sense, but it goes so far, right? Because if you consider yourself as a capitalist individual or a company, then comp competition should be fair game, but not to the point of removing competition for the sole benefit and you know, which leads to stagnation in a sense, right? Apple is in the same case. Have they been innovating for the last few years compared to their, you know, several decades ago? Can, we just have to wait and see uh, how this plans out. And as, as law, lawmaker says here, you know, it's a, it's a big uphill battle, but you know, the question here is who gets to watch those, uh, monitor those, who can be considered the gatekeeper of those tech giants so we have to wait and see what happens there and speaking of tech giants so amazon oh sorry not amazon but a big big company like uh, walmart and i think we've been discussing it for a few weeks ago in terms of buying tiktok partnership partnering with oracle but with their latest investment in the Indian market to gain a foothold in that market up uh, it's the next largest market outside of China and with today's news it mentions here that the that Walmart who owns Asda is a retail chain in Europe is being bought out by the British brothers TDR in the sum of 8.8 .8 billion dollars so as you can see here, so the Britain's billionaire, Isa Brothers, as they call it, who owns the private equity group, TDR Capital Group, have bought Asda from Walmart in, for the amount of $8.8 Now, is it seen as a means for, for Walmart uh, exiting the European market and concentrating on the Asian market? Not necessarily because based on the article here, there's still... They still have a minority minority stake in the company, but not as much as before. Now, the question here is why the focus on the Asian market here? Now, obviously, you know, with the growing population in India, it's a even lucrative, and the potential of generating revenue is lucrative to the point. But the point here is why did TDR buy uh, Asda here? Now, obviously the as according to the, uh, what do you call this? As according to the Walmart CEO, Judith McKenna, uh, it stated that it's not about job cuts. So it's not about reducing the employees here, despite the pandemic. It's about targeting growth by expanding into convenience shops. So changing from their typical large supermarket and online operations to shifting more convenience shops, which is already accessible uh, nationwide. Now they're competing with the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury now. Obviously, the retail market, the retail industry or sector in uh, Britain is a very tightly contested one, which makes sense if you're Walmart. If you think that's very competitive and you're looking for other markets to capitalize, then now's the best time to get out of that market. But they're still living hope that they still have a footprint in the particular market. So as mentioned here, Walmart will still retain an unspecified minority stake and they will continue their commercial relationship as well as having a board seat here. And as I mentioned earlier, they continue to refocus its international efforts on markets with long-term upside. So meaning the potential of upside in the European market is not as much compared to India as well as in China here. So question is, 
is this the benefit for beneficial for Walmart for selling the company? Maybe so, so that they could use those resources they have generated and invest it in other regions as well here. Next, we have here, speaking of the tech giant, we just discussed Amazon earlier. Now, obviously, many businesses have already been trying to expand or resume their operations, even though you know people are stuck at home or limited, but you know, with online preferences or buying behavior from your customers or from individuals, especially like me. So the question here is, what can they do? So obviously, Amazon's demand has an you know has increased dramatically and they need those frontliner people whether delivery or in their warehouses have to rely on those people to provide those services but at what cost obviously people are congregating in one particular facility and guess what you know it's unavoidable to get infected with the COVID-19 situation here and as you can clearly see here and if it weren't I would say a whistleblower but according to reports that you know you'll be surprised how much how many people tested positive in the workplace? By as much as 20,000 people. Now, for us, personally, for me personally, I think it's a very high amount, but I guess for Amazon, it's a number that they can live with. So let's take a closer look here. As I mentioned, almost 20,000 Amazon workers in the United States test positive for COVID-19. That should, you know, cause some alarms if you're a multi-billion company like Amazon is and you know demands for public disclosure you know is an all-time high here because you know the number could be even significantly high if you think about it and they've already faced scrutiny in terms of their practices of firing people if they are voicing out their concerns and now you have reports or not just reports but you know actual cases being reported as much as 20,000 people getting infected so what is the company supposed to do should they stop operations how to deal with it is it a it's a PR nightmare if you think about it now here's the key point it stated here according to Amazon the analyst suggested that the rate of infection among 1.4 million workers at Amazon and its whole food subsidiary is considered lower compared to other broader US population now that seems you know using statistics here to to skew the fact that you're a multinational company and you employ millions of people here and you could care I would say you could care less but even though the number is only if you if you do the math 20,000 versus 1.4 million people that's roughly less than 1.5 percent of your population so they're willing to accept that it's a very low statistics here compared to other regions other nations which is you know the point here is is the workplace safe i don't think you would risk your employees getting sick because if your employees get sick they could infect their family and those family members can infect other peoples and so forth and so forth. And, you know we're in a pandemic right now so i think amazon should reconsider their position here and how to deal, best deal with it it's not just say that you know it's an accepted fact that you know they're willing to take on the risk as long as they can continue with their operations which is they're already reaping their benefits in terms of increased demand increased services from their key customers and it's not just that as mentioned here the highest rate in terms of state is in minnesota which is significantly higher double the amount where it's at 3.17 percent the question here is how safe is the workplace you know it's not just about even though you know they're stating that they've invested millions of dollars in its own coronavirus testing program but that's after the fact if you contract the disease then you have to get tested but how can you prevent it shouldn't it be a preventive measure sort of creating a bubble so to speak so that you ensure that people in the workplace when they come to work they would feel safe which is the whole point here otherwise I'm sure Amazon can't ill afford to have their key employees in the warehouse stay at home because, you know, at the end of the day, the bulk of the work of transferring products from uh, their warehouses to the delivery points has to be, you know, there has to be someone manning the position there. And according to a U.S. activist group, Athena, and they stated Amazon allowed 
the COVID-19 to spread like wildfire in its facilities, okay? Risking the health of tens of thousands of people who work at Amazon, which goes back to my point. I'm sure uh, top management already knew about this and the question is, did they just allow it? And would there be any ramification in terms of any wrongdoing on their part or mismanagement or careless? I won't say carelessness because they already knew the data coming in that people were getting infected, they still continue to operate, right? But for other companies, right, if there is a number spike in cases, they would shut down their operations, right? Because you know it's not just about the bottom line here, but you have to consider the welfare of your customers as well as your employees, your partners in the business, and so forth. Anyway, so it's not just Amazon who's in trouble here. Now, other companies who've been trying to resume their operations are, you would say, having difficulties, right? For some, it's too late. They have to close their shop already. But for others, they're having a difficult time surviving, right? And one such company is the Disney company here, the, the theme park that they have, which is Disneyland, right? And according to the report here, so... If you're staying in California or if you plan to visit Disney California, there, there has been a delay in terms of when they should reopen again in terms of theme park guidelines, so to speak. So it's not the case for the other region, in, in particular in Florida. Disney World is open right now and other uh, Disney theme parks in different countries as well. Let's take a look here. As mentioned here, so... The reopening of Disney California has been on put on hold. And this is according to the California Health Secretary. And they want to hear more in terms of input, in terms of how the operators can safely resume their operation. Now, is it an easy task? I think it's a complicated matter because for one thing, how can you monitor tens of thousands of people going to a uh, facility like Disney theme park that it is? You just you have how many people working in that particular team park on a daily basis then you have tens of thousands 10 20 30 50 you know at peak times 50,000 60,000 people going to the team park so it's hard to manage it right so what are the protocols here and what's the tipping point up to, up to a certain point if let's say a number of people who get infected you know would they shut down and would they shut down for good and the consequence of you know not reopening has caused the Disney executive chairman Bob Iger to resign from the California Task Force. Task Force, Task Force, Task Force. Sorry, getting tongue tied. California Task Force on whether to reopen the business during the pandemic. Now, obviously, with the continued closure, this has exacerbated their financial strain on its park division from the pandemic, and they plan to lay off 28,000 people, which. I do have a, a problem with that one because if you're encountering difficulties, the easy solution is just to lay off employees. So what happened to the previous years that you were generating millions and billions of revenue here? So you were not able to save those money and ensure that whether uh, when the pandemic or crisis occurs that you are able to, to stave off you know, elimination in such, such case. And the easy cop up is to just remove or uh, remove those employees who are hardworking employees, right? And why not just you know sacrifice the millions and millions of salaries of those top management so that the company can stay afloat for the foreseeable future here? But I guess that's not going to happen here. And the employees are always the first one to go. And it's not just that. And if you notice here, given the size and operational complexities of this unique sector they're also seeking additional input from health workforce and business stakeholders to finalize the important framework all leading to science and safety well that's the difficult part here can the theme park or can disney theme park guarantee the safety of the visitors here which leads us to our next point here even though you know other parks have resumed like in the case of how would you call this disney world in florida well, it's open now, but at a limited capacity, right? So right now, I think they're open only, they only allow 10, 10 11 or 12,000 visitors to visit their theme park. Now, one would assume that it's a positive for those visitors. Typically, if you go 
on a typic, uh, typical opening on a theme park, you know, they have 20, 30, 40, or even 50,000 visitors on a given day. And, you know, a lot of people, it's jam-packed. So if you're going to different rides, see shows, you know, the queuing time takes a long time, right? So one would assume that with the limited number of visitors, the queuing time would be shorter. No, that's not the case here. So because of tightening control, limiting the number of rides, lim closing certain shows so that, you know, there's less uh, contact with one another, you know, it's the total opposite. It's even longer. So meaning the experience may not be as enjoyable as one would think. And how long can theme parks uh, continue this operation without letting the entire general public, you know, at full capacity, so to speak here. So there are pros and cons here. But again, first and foremost, Disney has to make drastic changes here. Not necessarily just remove employees or lay off employees because, you know, your business model is not taking into account, you know, the situation that is the pandemic, right? If it persists for a few more months or even to next year you know you have to adjust accordingly right and you know in terms of you know financial woes it, it just goes to show uh, leveraging your business in terms of debt you know has its limits and it exposes many businesses it's not just a disney company here but other companies as well who invested or tried to expand too much and then using that as a leverage to increase their market share and so forth. So we'll see how long can they last. Continuing, so it's not just Disneyland who's in trouble here, but also uh, in the entertainment industry. So speaking of movies, so how long have you last went to see a movie, right? Go, go into a the movie theater. So... Obviously, right now, they're reopening. They've already reopened many of the movie theaters. But the question here is, we've discussed in previous uh, discussion. Yeah, it's open, but what can we watch? Now, there have been some movies that have been released. Supposed to be it was Mulan, but, you know, nothing happened. Because they shift the release to streaming videos for HBO, I think, or Disney. Disney Plus, I think. And then we were expecting the release of... Later this year supposed to be James Bond this one. Then you have Wonder Woman is another. All have been pushed already. For Wonder Woman, it's already pushed later this year. James Bond has been pushed to next year. And a lot of movies have been pushed indefinitely. Now, there's only one silver lining that has been mentioned with all of this. I think with the movie of Matrix 4, Keanu, Keanu Reeves' movie has been pushed up a bit. So you can look forward to watching that late, later this year. Anyway, so let's take a look closer look here. So as mentioned here, I oh, sorry. So as mentioned, so Cine, Cineworld, who is owned by Regal, is considering closing all cinemas, not just in the United States, but as well as across the border, which is in United Kingdom. And Cineworld is the second largest cinema operator. Okay, and with the Latest casualty, which is James Bond, which was supposed to be released later this year, has been, you know, scuffled. And this could, again, look at their reaction here. They, they would, you know, if they were to close those cinemas, do they have to fire those people eventually? And they're already seriously considering temporary closure of all their movies. And there's no final yet, but, you know, Sooner or later, they will come to a realization that, you know, it's not profitable anymore if they continue operating. And, you know, I think the, what was supposed to be a indicator was the ten, ten, tenant film by, Nolan, I forgot the director, Christopher Nolan, I think. Yeah, I think that's him. And, you know, it, it didn't fare so well. So, obviously, filmmakers or, you know, movie outfits are afraid to release their film especially this year knowing that people are not going to fully support their movies because it's not safe right unless movie theaters can guarantee the safety of individuals and you know people themselves uh would change their mind that okay it's 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 okay to go back out there it's safe to watch with your loved ones with your family with your kids and so forth but until that time comes 
think it's going to be an uphill battle before people would go back to cinemas watching their favorite film. And as I mentioned, so the film James Bond, the No Time to Die, which was I was looking for forward to watch, has been pushed already for next year. Then there's the movie of uh, what was it? I think that's Batman. Okay, so it was pushed because of their main star having contracted the virus here. So Robert Pattinson, the who's who's donning the cape this time, has has tested positive. So they have to delay their uh, shooting again, and then the the release has been pushed all the way to next year. And obviously, in terms of release, they have a set schedule there. So if you're not able to release it. It would push the other films that has to post, that was supposed to be released on that particular day. And then it's keep on pushing and pushing and pushing all the way to next, even to the next next year. So the problem here for the cinemas here, they might need to raise more money if they were forced to shut down again. And it, it, you know, it could cost them around 1.6 billion dollars. And that doesn't bode well, right? So it's not just you know seeing the world. Cine world uh, who's affected here you also have mac amc AM, amc so it's a, it's another so again there are other films like ah uh, yes the superhero black widow has been pushed and then the steven spielberg's west side story has been pushed also so there's no incentive for those films to be released if they know there even a slight chance that they might not generate what they expect to be on a normal uh pre-pandemic period Right, so a lot of businesses are having to pivot and find solutions to their given situation. Can they last? We have to wait and see. You know, it's the who can survive the longest will actually win eventually. We have to wait and see here. Continuing here, so for some local story here. Now we've been talking about the fate of ABS CBN, you know, in terms of how they dealt with you know their license renewal of their licensing fee which didn't go too well with our government and you know all is not lost in a way because they're coming back so a, a little bit more to that story so let's take a closer look here now obviously the abc network has been shut down and faces uncertain future now we're in their board of director or the head of the company Eugenio Lopez has walked away or has resigned from their business empire. Now, key word here is empire. So, even though one portion of their business has already been shut down, they already they also have other business interests as well. So, it's not all doom and gloom for them, but not for so for the employees who work for the broadcasting giant, what used to be the broadcasting giant. And obviously, Lopez was the latest line of tycoons for the Philippines had. Uh, in the Philippines had run a fall or go against with our president Duterte by bringing down the oligarchs on one of his campaigns. So we'll take a closer look here. So as mentioned here, the Eugenio uh, Gabi Lopez III uh, resigned last month uh, as being the chairman of ABS-CBN Philippines. And obviously, they butted heads in a sense. And what caused this? We'll discuss it a little bit later on. Anyway, so the licensing fee, which was you know supposed to be renewed this year, but with the feuding that is going on with ABS-CBN with the current president Duterte, you know, the president fulfilled its threat by not renewing its license. Okay. Now, obviously, ABS has relies on their advertising revenue, which amounted to 500 billion pesos. If you see here which is around 10 billion dollars and they had a you know market share leader of 42 percent nationwide compared to only uh, GMA's 30 percent well I guess that's down the drain now obviously GMA has taken advantage will take advantage of that and become the leader market market leader in the broadcasting network here and as mentioned here they have to start slashing their workforce it's doom and gloom for them not necessarily because Actually, for those who are an avid uh, ABSCN uh, viewer, they've already tied up with another uh, broadcasting network, uh, Zoe, Net Zoe Broadcasting Network, which is owned by, uh, I forgot his name, it's a religious uh, uh, channel where they will tie up so that you get to watch some 
uh, ABS CBN shows as well as movies. So that's something to look for, and it's for free. So you don't have to pay anything for watching their show. Anyway, so what brought this about being the uh, the way the feud that's going on between the president and ABS CBN here? Well, it all stemmed back during the president's presidential campaign way back in 2016 when he paid a campaign for advertisement that year well guess what that never came to be and obviously the president did not like it at that time so and the uh, slow payment for for payback fee is another issue well that doesn't bode well <laughs> if you're trying to irritate you know the the president of the philippines and what they did was, you know, broadcast advertisement of an opposition senator at that time. And then obviously ran amok against, you know, saying bad things about the running president at the time. And what happens later? Okay, so he mentions that the country's largest newspaper, which was inquired at the time, and ABCN for being rude, unfair, and trash reporting. Okay. And what he said later on was interesting. So, based on what happened here, payback by way of karma, which was stated by the, which was, you know, which was a precursor of what happened to inquire later on, which had to be shut down. And obviously, what happened here, he was not happy how it was dealt with. And you can see here, oh, where is it? Yeah. Okay. So during the Senate hearing, the positions have changed. We're in uh, Duterte's former chief of staff or aid, Senator Bongo, gave the company another warning sign. All the president wants is fair reporting, which I guess they did not listen to. So what happened next was, you know, they were supposed to uh, repay or pay back the fee that they did. They did not air his, uh, what do you call this? Air his advertisement. So the company had paid the first portion fee back to the 30, but the second final portion was not given. And it was a strategic position by the president, uh, running president at the time, so that they have ammunition to go after the company after the fact, which they did, which they were able to you know turn the tide later on so i guess you don't want to get on the bad side of our current president here you know sometimes getting too cocky and you know, thinking that no one can uh, what do you call this no one will be able to monitor you because you're a big giant company that you are well look at the repercussion one wrong one bad decision necessitated by you know you having to fire your several thousands of employees here and I'm hoping, hopefully, this is a learning lesson. And you know, there's there's still hope for ABS because, as I mentioned, the new tie-up with Zoe Broadcasting Network will uh, give people uh, something to look forward to to watch those uh, their favorite shows on ABS-CBN. Anyway, continuing. So, China Bank is granting employees. 100 shares per year of their service, which is sounds great, right? If you think about it. So working, uh, being loyal to your company, you will be rewarded for equity shares of the company. My question here is, why did it take China Bank 100 years to give their employees equity stake? Shouldn't that be a prerequisite for uh, making sure people that work hard for you who have invested time and effort in your company who performs well should be rewarded obviously it's not just about monetary rewards recognition and so forth but also a stake in the company so that they would feel a stake uh, literally figuratively that they are part of the family because they own a portion of that company here so as mentioned here in the article so to commemorate its centennial year, the China Bank Corporation is extending its ownership to employees. So as mentioned, so the bank approved
continuing with the pandemic that's going on now obviously customer preferences has already shifted from uh buying to brick and mortar shops to transitioning to a online based you know purchasing uh, purchasing items online so we're ever more so reliant on internet services provided by our telcos whether it be from smart globe or even pldt but based on rankings in in our previous discussion we're lagging behind and we're considered one of the most expensive uh what do you call this most expensive internet service that we have to pay and yet we are provided with the slowest internet service in the region and what's the repercussion here obviously it's not just the services but also we're getting left behind in terms of you know adopting to a digital business platform which is the digital economy that you know which is being you know which is booming as you can see with uh with amazon generating more revenues at an all-time high walmart google apple you know people buying uh online stuff or softwares or games and so forth right it's an all-time high but sad to say on our case we're on the other end of the spectrum here so philippine risk getting left behind as internet remains slow and expensive so the digital economy for our country may be failed to realize its full potential obviously lacking of digital infrastructure remains weak and internet speeds are among the slowest and most expensive in the world obviously this doesn't bode well for our, for our country and you know we can miss out on certain opportunities especially for businesses who wanted who wants to transition their uh, business to an online platform if we cannot rely on our technology to be stable how can our customers rely on those services so obviously government has to find ways to push our telcos or regulate them in such a way that they have to provide better service so that our customers our businesses can benefit so that our economy can benefit so that the our government can generate more revenue more tax collection which you know in turn can benefit the country as a whole and this was stated according to the digital economy report way back uh, way way back the, according to the report this year right so the adoption digital adoption in the philippines will become more efficient and competitive if if we need to ramp up the digital adoption here as mentioned here so we still have a long ways to go here and as you can clearly see here you know we're lagging behind in terms of our Asian counterparts in terms of pop share population we're 70 percent compared to 88 percent then LG LTE broadband network coverage we're 72 percent while ASEAN nation is 82 percent and what's troubling here is the share population of fixed broadband subscribers is only 4% compared to 10. Then the speed in terms of 4G and 3G download speed is only 7 compared to 13. So it's significant. It's half the speed. And compared to the fixed broadband average download speed, it's half the speed. Now, is this bad? You know, in a sense? If you look at it, you know, those who are ha having access can benefit from it tremendously and those who do not have access you know the gap is getting wider and wider it's similar to the inequality of wealth here the rich are getting richer having more access to different parts while the poor are getting more poorer and you know even less access to the basic necessities that we rely upon especially people nowadays having transitioned to a more online presence whether for business for entertainment for communication for all types of services i think you know that's the trend that we should be focusing on on the digital economy here and you know we have to wait and see and finally for our last story okay, here's an interesting here now obviously during the lockdown we're stuck at home we don't know what to do uh, we're working we're studying you know after a hard day's work what do we do we tend to eat a lot eat more drink more and which leads us to our next topic here now you might be surprised now one of the most dangerous products that you can drink is a soda i think that's a given right but you might be surprised what type of soda is considered dangerous or the most dangerous 
It's not Coca-Cola. It's something else altogether. So let's take a closer look here. So the most dangerous kind of soda is not a Coca-Cola. The most dangerous soda kind of soda is is a pineapple soda. Okay? So the pineapple soda is considered the most dangerous. So why is it? Now obviously when you talk of sodas here, you know, it's unhealthy for anyone to drink too much of something is always bad and it's always associated with uh, too much soda consumption could lead to gain weight and can also lead to you know having type 2 diabetes which is not good right and then according to this article they mentioned that there was a study published that uh, that found that who drink artificially sweetened drinks could likely you know more likely to die prematurely compared to those who who rarely or never drink uh, sodas in the first place but the question here is what makes this particular soda or pineapple soda so dangerous so let's take a look closer look in their ingredients so per 12 ounce of can so as you can see here it has a start clean 190 calories so it's not healthy then look at the sodium content it has 65 that's way too high and look at the the grams in terms of carbs or sugar content it's 52 grams here so all are significantly higher if you compare that to you know uh, on average what you're supposed to be taking in terms of carbohydrate uh, not carbs sugar content you, you're only supposed to take on a daily basis half of 50 51 grams so around 20 20 something depending whether you're male or female same goes to sodium content here so you know, it's not safe for drinking too much of it now obviously it's stated here now obviously even though pineapple soda is the the worst doesn't necessarily mean that coca-cola is the safest alternative all types of soda is not healthy if you think about it so that's something to consider when you're trying to enjoy yourself with a, a can of soda and once more there it, they're equating that a pineapple juice is similar to when you're buying five donuts which is you know full of sweets I can barely eat two donuts at a time and you're just like eating five donuts at a time versus one can of soda here and obviously you know it doesn't bode well if you want to stay healthy especially in this particular period you know no one wants to get sick so we need to avoid unhealthy products unhealthy food unhealthy drinks and try to eat as much as possible healthy products so that can stay safe and healthy the whole time okay and i think that concludes our discussion for this week so always don't forget to hit the notification bell icon so you can stay updated with the latest news as well as videos also don't forget to leave your comments down below and hit the like button. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you again next week. Same time, same channel. Take care.